12, we're going to look at one of the verses that we read uh, together responsibly about the implications of being in the body. 1 Corinthians 12, we're just going to read one verse, verse 26. I'm going to ask you to stand with me if you would. As we read God's Word, you follow along in your Bibles. If you don't have a Bible, we've got this on the screen for you today. As has already been said, it's the International Day of Prayer for the Persecuted Church. It was celebrated last Sunday in certain places, celebrated today by us. The theme this year is ashes, from ashes to glory. And so I want us to see in this verse where it talks about that. And then ask ourselves, let this grip us. Do I, am I gripped by the suffering of those around me and those around the world? And do I rejoice in the blessedness that comes to those around me and those around the world? Verse 26 says, if one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. What have we just read? The inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient Word of God. And I pray for myself more of this and pray that for you that we not, we not succumb to the numbing effect of living as the church in the West where our biggest concerns are how the pews feel, the temperature in the room, whether or not the preacher goes too long and invades lunch, et cetera, et cetera, BS ad nauseum. I want us to pray for the persecuted church. I want us to pray for those our own members. That song we just sang, there's a day coming when the persecuted church will not have to hide, will not be hunted down like dogs. There's a day coming when the pains that you're experiencing or those of your loved ones will be gone. But the commitment has to be for us that starting now and certainly stretching into eternity, all the glory will go to God. We will glorify the Lord by loving Him and enjoying Him forever no matter what our situation be. Let's pray. Dear Holy Father, we bow before you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. and We're grateful for those who stand fast around the world in the face of great trial, challenge, tragedy. And I pray that you will help us to use this time today to recommit, re-embrace what your scripture calls us to do and expresses how we will live if we are in the body. That we will fellowship in the sufferings of our brothers and sisters in Christ around the world who are paying the great price for following Christ. And then I pray for those in our own congregation. Lord, we've got people that are, that are facing challenges. They're, they're in, some in constant pain, some caring for little ones who, who have uh, startling diseases. Some of us experiencing the, the effects of, of drawing nearer to heaven. And I pray that in every situation, you will touch, you will comfort, we appeal to you as Jehovah Rapha, the God who heals, that you would be pleased to heal through medical means approaching or directly outright. You're, there's, there's not a thing you don't have at your disposal and we know that if it is your pleasure to heal, that there's not a diagnosis given by a physician that can stand in the way of that. And so we simply give our precious brothers and sisters in Christ here to you and pray, touch, Lord, strengthen, deliver, sustain, 
encourage, comfort, be, be the God of all comfort. To these we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. Please be seated. We remembering the persecuted church is not just about remembering them somewhere. Our text tells us as much. If one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. Scripture affirms that the Christian life is a call to glory through suffering. I used to read this passage years ago and kind of be puzzled at it. Look at Romans 8, 16 and 17 with me. Where Paul begins that chapter, chapter 8, verse 1, there is now therefore no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. And he concludes the 8th chapter of Romans saying, there can be no separation from the love of God in Christ Jesus. But in the middle of it, he says this, the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs. Mark this. Heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. This is not a call to, to run out like a, like a Shiite Muslim and take a chain and beat yourself over the back with it to show that you know how to suffer. This is a call to embrace suffering and embrace those who suffer by remembering them. On a daily basis around the world, Christians face persecution in various forms, discrimination, physical assaults, violence, and even martyrdom, death. And the Bible calls us in Hebrews 13, 3, we have read this together in past years, and I think we need to read it again today, to pray for those suffering as if they themselves were suffering. Look at the Hebrews 13, 3. Remember those who are in prison as though in prison with them and those who are mistreated, since you also are in the body. We need to identify with Christians in our suffering. And brothers and sisters, I said to you a year ago and a couple of years ago that if America continued the, on the path it was going, that we here would face the very same things that our brothers and sisters in Christ around the world are facing. And it's still coming. It doesn't matter who's in the White House. The person sitting in the White House cannot stop a madman who has a, has a burning, growing hatred for Christians from coming into the safety of where they meet and gunning them down. We were reminded of that this past Sunday. The White House cannot stop a jihadist who by his very creed hates Christians and calls Christians infidels from doing unimaginable damage. We must identify with our brothers and sisters in Christ who suffer as if suffering with them. And as Brother Norman mentioned, the International Day of Prayer for the Persecuted Church has identified millions of Christians around the world and then unified them. And I like what he said. You see, recognizing what we're recognizing, being a part of this, of this worldwide movement and remembrance will keep us aware. You need to know every Wednesday night when January starts, Part of our time of prayer is spent praying for the most difficult places on the earth to be a Christian. If you're not with us on Wednesday nights, I hope you are doing that at home. You will not cultivate a mindset to remember the persecuted church if you're not intentionally, regularly crying out to God for them. They suffer in silence. The statistics are, are staggering. 
The other part of this movement is that people like Voice of the Martyrs and uh, I just went blank, Linda, the folks that open doors whose, whose prayer, whose watch list we track, communicate to these Christians in the difficult places, the church around the world is praying for you, remembering you, loving you. God uses the prayers of His people to strengthen and deliver suffering saints. So what about this text? Well, the ashes refer to the persecution of the church. The glory, the advance of the gospel. I want you to see this just a few minutes here. The ashes that if one member suffers, all suffer together. In Malaysia, Pastor Raymond Coe was kidnapped in February. He's still missing all these months later. Many Muslim background believers who are pastors and leaders have also gone missing in Malaysia. Many Christians have been killed in Egypt, including seven in the North Sinai town of Al Arish. Since the year began, armed herdsmen have killed more than 200 people and injured 500 others in predominant Christian areas of Nazarawa in Nigeria. In Turkey, a U.S. citizen, Dr. Andrew Brunson, continues to be imprisoned on charges of terrorism because he was there ministering, is there ministering the gospel. In Sri Lanka, around 200 incidents of persecution have been recorded since 2015, including the closure of or demands to close down 50 or more churches. If you read the different data available, many experts suggest that our, our numbers say 100 million, but Many experts suggest that more than 200 million people in over 60 nations face violent persecution or detention because of their identity as Christians. At least that many or more are discriminated against on a regular basis because of the faith. How many Christians are martyred each year? It's difficult to know. Christians are killed for their faith daily. When we dig in and try to find out how many, it's more than most of us could imagine. Most martyrs suffer and die anonymously, unknown, forgotten, their deaths unrecorded except in heaven. Even things like email, which we take for granted, are monitored and shut off in some of the difficult places like Ethiopia, Burma, much of Central Africa. Even if it's available, persecuted Christians dare not use it because it's, it's being monitored by the government and they would be discovered. Much of the tragedy goes unreported for months or even years. For many Christians, persecution is such a part of life that it hardly dawns on the afflicted to tell the world. They think that's what Christianity is. What, what would be noteworthy to the rest of the world about that? They don't know who to tell anyway. The organizations that are available may be so far off or so limited in access. Many are nervous about sharing what they know for fear of retribution. Persecution in its very nature defies being statistically analyzed with any degree of certitude. Christians, however, are the largest identifiable group in the world today who are denied their basic human rights simply because of who they are. Until the election last year, the sitting administration in Washington, D.C. denied suffering Christians by the thousands access to our country. And when they did manage to make it here, our government would send them back to their homelands knowing they would face certain death. All because they identify with Jesus Christ. That's the ashes. Do you suffer with them? Do you feel that when we talk about it? When you see videos of a pastor in Syria who when someone says, how do you handle this? And he just breaks up. He, he doesn't have words to express it. Do you suffer when one of the Anglican bishops in Iraq 
broke down weeping several years ago and said they are slaughtering my congregation. My sheep, my little lambs are being slaughtered. Do you feel it? See, we've got to feel it first. But there's the glory. The advance of the gospel. This is the phenomenal thing. And in fact, if you know anything about church history, you know that, that church history always, Christianity always thrives historically when it's counterculture. When it's the dominant culture, it grows fat and lazy and complacent and smug and inwardly focused. But where it's counterculture, it thrives. You say, that's the, that's the good news is if one member is honored, all rejoice together. Let me give you some good news in the face of the tragedy. In 1960, there were twice as many evangelical Christians in the West as in the rest of the world. Forty years later, 2000, and it's only grown since then, there are now four times as many evangelical Christians in non-Western nations as in the West. And that number is larger in 2017. Evangelicals are growing at a rate three times faster than the world's population growth rate outside of the West and the world's only body of religious adherents who are growing by means of conversion. In 2000, evangelicals had an annual growth of almost 5%, while Islam grew at half that rate. In China, the Protestant church had maybe 1,200,000 Christians in 1949. Today the church has grown to at least, get this now, 81 million members, both in the registered churches and the unregistered house church movement. The Catholic church has grown from 3 million to over 12 million during the same 50 year period. In Africa alone, the rate of church growth has been nothing short of staggering, skyrocketing from an estimated 10 million Christians in 1900 to 360 million Christians in 2000. The church in Sudan, which was near the top of the list in our 50 uh, countdown this, this year, the church in Sudan is the fastest growing church in the Muslim world. Remember Sudan? Remember the Shipping crates for jails, pictures we saw that Gatana Gatana brought to us. This is despite facing some of the most horrendous persecution known to man in recent years. It's intensified every year. They keep climbing up the watch list. In Ethiopia, the church has exploded. In 1960, evangelicals numbered 200,000, made up less than 1% of the population. In 40 years, by 2000, the church has grown to nearly 12 million, making 20% of the population. This has taken place despite the great persecution during the communist era, 1974 to 1991. Today, converts in rural areas face great persecution, stoning, bombing of church buildings, discrimination, expulsion from their homes, driven from their villages uh, in large numbers. In India, India now has 10 churches with more than 10,000 members and 30 that have more than 3,000 members. In 1999, one church leader reported baptizing, get this, 2,231 people in a single day. Folks, they don't baptize up there. They baptize in open bodies of water. Some Indian denominations are reporting that they are planting a new church every day. Among the Hmong people, H-M-O-N-G, the Hmong people from northern Vietnam. Now get this, because there's a Hmong congregation in Tulsa. And there are Hmong peoples living in the community north of us. There were no evangelical Christians in 1989. In 11 years, by 2000, they numbered over 175,000 and all of this church growth has taken place while being brutally oppressed by the Vietnamese authorities. One of the main reasons, and I thought this was an interesting thing that I read this, one of the main reasons for the persecution of Christians worldwide has been because of its rapid growth. Now, parenthetically, you wonder, 
maybe the reason we're not being persecuted on this scale here is because we're not growing by leaps and bounds to make a significant impact in a increasingly, and we've seen it recently as we studied through the Reformation, increasingly secular, postmodern, post-Christian, pre-Reformation culture. It's because of rapid growth. It's truer, this is what I thought was fascinating, it's truer to say that church growth causes persecution than that persecution causes church growth. And I think that it's sort of a, it's a six to one, half a dozen of another. It's a both and cycle. In some countries, such as Iraq and Jordan and Syria, other parts of the Middle East, persecution has actually caused the church to significantly shrink in size over the past 100 years because of the wholesale slaughter and the fleeing from that. So I want to ask you, Do you suffer for the persecuted church? When one member suffer, all suffer together. See, I don't, I don't enough. I'm thankful to God that I'm hit in the face every week with another place on the planet where my brothers and sisters in Christ pay incredible prices for their fellowship. I tremble to think, what what kind of person would I be if I wasn't facing that every week, 50 weeks out of the year? I'm grateful that I don't live life looking through an empty toilet paper holder anymore, thinking that if it's not happening within that screen, then it's not happening. In fact, I used to think if it wasn't happening in in America, then it wasn't happening. And what what a prideful, bigoted, provincial Christian I was. I used to read Fox's Book of Martyrs and think, well, that was, that was terrible then. There's no was to it. Before we pillow our heads tonight, brothers and sisters in Christ, somewhere on the planet, will have paid the ultimate price. Simply because they dare name the name of Jesus. Oh, I want to be shaken out of my lethargy. I want to be shaken out of my complacency. I want to pull my head out of of the Western religious sand and see, to look upon the fields. I ask myself as I ask you, do we suffer? Do we grieve? Does it break our hearts? Do we weep over the persecuted church? Because the scripture says normative Christianity means that when one member of the body suffers, all the body suffers. If I was talking to you and someone walked up and had a sledgehammer and hit your right foot with a sledgehammer, I would would be shocked, first of all, and you went, oh, no big deal, it's just my foot. Because that's not that's not normative. That's not how you think. That's not life. And yet, the text we read together, we are the body and individually members of it. But also, do you rejoice at the advance of the gospel worldwide where the church faces the fiercest persecution? As you grieve, do you praise God? Thank you, Lord. Thank you that... In these hard places, Sudan, Afghanistan, Pakistan, Syria, North Korea. That the gospel is exploding there. That they are being persecuted because the gospel is advancing like wildfire. Do we rejoice with them and then take that and say, dear God, do that here. Do that through me. Do that through our church. Don't let us just rock along in the, in the cradle of, of ease and complacency. Oh, God, move in us. Move through us. Teach us to live a questionable life so that those we encounter 
will recognize that we march to the beat of a different drum. We're not lemmings being led off the cliff of American consumerism. Do you rejoice? Do you suffer? Do you, do you ache? To see the gospel come in such power and move through the church in the West, through this church, so that folks will begin to raise their eyebrows and think, I'm not sure what we need to do with these people. That needs to be stopped. That's my prayer for myself first. I confess I'm a pitiful leader when it comes to this. You pray for me and I pray for you. We'll pray for one another. Oh, Lord, light a fire in us so that it can be said. We don't just read it in the Scripture. That when, the, when one suffers in the body, whether that's this local body, whether it's the body at large, when one suffers, we all are gripped and suffer. And that when one rejoices, when we hear of the gospel advancing anywhere, that it lights our fire. And we thank God that Jesus Christ, that the name and fame of Jesus is going forward and make us have a holy jealousy to get in on it. What about you, though? Do you even know him? Do you know him? Have you confessed him? Do you, do you ignore Jesus when multitudes around the world are dying for him? What must that look like from heaven? Oh, I pray, I pray that you'll be shaken from that, that you'll seek out a Savior, and Jesus, you'll find, will save you. That as you repent of your sins and trust in him as your hope of life now and life to come, that you'll find that he saves you and you'll join the church militant, advancing the gospel. Until that day we sang about it when we see all that he's done for us. See him face to face, surrounded by his grace, lifting his name high. No more weeping, no more sorrow, no more sadness, no more sickness, no more being hunted down and killed by those who hate Jesus. No more hiding on that day. I pray that you're ready for that day. Let's pray. Dear Holy Father, we come to you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and help us, Lord. Help us to, to be moved in the depths of our soul by the plight of our brothers and sisters in Christ around the world. Not just around the world. Help us, Lord, to be grieved to our core by the First Baptist Church of Sutherland Springs, Texas which tasted a measure last week of what many around the world live with daily. Killed for being Christians. Oh God. Help us to learn to suffer with those who suffer. Help us to learn to rejoice with those who rejoice with a commitment to take the name of Jesus wherever we go. May we, through our labors and your blessings upon our labors, catch the attention of authorities so that they'll have to decide what do we need to do with these folks. We ask this in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Let's stand together as we sing this morning. If you're here and you want to apply for membership, present yourself for membership, talk to us about that. Share with